Well, thank you so much for making it all the way in um, and finally getting into the building. This is the great thing about having sort of live sessions that anything can go wrong. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm glad you finally got into the building. More importantly, Nikki, what time is it over in Oz? It's 6 a.m. It's 6 a.m. And I got to the building. I, I, to be, I did get here at quarter two, um, uh, but like literally, there's nobody on the streets. It's utterly deserted. The uh, the Australians clearly don't get out of bed before sunrise. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there's obviously some people that have joined after I did the intro, so I'm just going to quickly go over it again. Um, so my name is Sharina Shiv. I'm an associate at the Entrepreneurship Lab, and I'm busy helping create a podcast for you busy people, so something you can have on the go. And again, you'll be able to catch up on this episode. We'll make sure we snip the beginning part off. <laughs> um, we're joined by the lovely Nikki Tate today, who has given up her time and has also been recognized as one of British LGBT top 10 inspirational leaders in that was just last year. She's also a successful entrepreneur, chair, CEO, author, and also self-proclaimed corporate drag queen, which I definitely want to find out more about during the conversation. Um, we're going to lightly touch on sort of some of the key principles of creating a successful business sales especially in the b2b section um, and also what goes into empowering women in business and something that's also close to nikki's heart which is diversity and inclusion but we'll spend the first sort of 20 minutes i'm going to give the floor to nikki to tell us a little bit more about what she's been working on um, and then we'll do i'll do an interview for 20 minutes and then we'll open it up to q a so if you have any questions please drop them in the bottom of the q a function box and we'll make sure before you leave you get all your questions asked so yeah, Nikki, over to you. Uh, okay, well, um, once again, apologies for being late uh, and thank you for having me. Um, I guess uh, obviously used to be a boy, but I'm all right now. I'd like to take that one off the table straight away. We'll, we can talk more about that later. Um, I thought I should probably give you a potted history. Um, so I, uh, I think I started, um, I started selling um, when I was 11 and 12, my dad owned um, a TV repair business when I was a kid and I would um, answer the phones and kind of book the appointments and then go out on the calls with him. Um, and then uh, when I was 16, took my first sales job um, selling uh, fresh coffee to businesses. I was telesales, managed to work out that uh, the best rep in the business was the lady that worked in uh, Nottingham and so I persuaded them that because I was going to go to Nottingham University at some point they should let me make calls there and um, I, I remember the deal was I would get paid a, a, a pittance like I think it was 50 pound a week was the salary and then I would get 10 pounds for every appointment and another 20 pound if she closed the deal um, and I at 16 was making 300 pound a week because I managed to find the best rep and book a lots of appointments. Um, and then uh, went to university, did a degree in uh, maths and computer science, um, uh, and then came out and um, decided that I needed to learn how to sell properly, took a sales job, and um, worked for four different companies in three different years until I got to be top salesperson in each, and then took the plunge and formed my own business in 1997. Um, which was a service business designed to help um, salespeople uh, deliver effective sales presentations. Um, and uh, that business is still going. It's called M62 Vincis. Vincis is the Latin word for you win. And what they do is help people win. Um, I don't run it anymore. It's, uh, um, it's now been run by uh, the management team. I still own most of the equity, but um, they run it quite successfully, uh, depressingly, perhaps even more successfully than when I ran it, but there you go. Um, and I now um, pretty much operate as an independent consultant. Um, I've just finished uh, an interim project with a large um, 
American company called MMC. Uh, I am actually sat in MMC's offices in Australia because I'm working on a project for them. And I guess uh, what I do now uh, is help big organizations win um, deals. So this deal I'm down here supporting is worth $720 million worth of revenue uh, for the business. Um, it, it's a significant game changer if if we win it for them um, and the way i operate is um you don't pay me unless you win um and then when you win you pay me a check but, um, and i don't really lose out because most people if you're going to spend 720 million on something you're going to talk to three four or five people in this case it was 12 and it got down selected to three and so the chances of winning a one in three and all my clients win three out of four so um, i'm not really gambling it kind of i do you know five or six of these a year and we win four that more than pays the bills so that's that's what i do and that's relevant i guess because my expertise uh, apart from how to um, present information in a memorable way. Um, I'm one experiment into a PhD in the cognitive psychology of memory because it seems to me as a salesperson you ought to understand why people buy off you and they don't buy off you when you're in the room. They buy off you tomorrow or next week or next month. So they're making their decision based on what they can remember of what you said to them. So we should understand how to put information in front of people in a way that is uh, mnemonic and sits in their memory so that it can influence their decision later on. That's how I win 75% of my deals by helping people figure out what the message is and then making sure that the audience can actually remember that message when they make their, their purchasing decision. Um, so, uh, I guess mm, that's probably enough background, uh, about me. Um, I was thinking about you guys as an audience, um, uh, and I thought I would say two things. Firstly, there's a massive misconception about what the word entrepreneur means. Um, I was sat at dinner once with my brother and, um, the, the, uh, waiter came up so you, you two seem to be having a very interesting conversation what do you two do for a living and before i could say anything my brother said oh, we're both entrepreneurs and i remember sitting in stunned silence for four minutes trying to work out what was it about being a dentist that he thought made him an entrepreneur mm -hmm. um, and what i realized is that lots of people think entrepreneur means business owner and it's just faulty logic. Like, like most entrepreneurs own businesses, yes, but all business owners are not entrepreneurs. So what is it? Um, my other favorite quote about entrepreneur is uh, George Bush famously saying, the problem with the French is they have no word for entrepreneur. It even sounds like it's obviously a French word. It's like entrepreneur is obviously a French word. I love the fact Bush had no idea. Coined by a French economist, to mean uh, moving resources from an area of low yield to an area of high yield. So inherent in the concept of entrepreneurship is we're going to do something differently. We're going to you do something innovatively to redeploy resources in a new way in order to create a new market or a new opportunity. There is novelty and innovation at the heart of, any, of every entrepreneurial endeavor and obviously that involves risk like not every new idea works and so um i remember interviewing what i did a job for a guy called mike harris who's a proper serial entrepreneur uh, founded first direct if you remember the bank um and and then a few other kind of big businesses um and i asked him to be a mentor and sit on my board and he smiled he said but i will give you a piece of advice and he said, the piece of advice is this. He said, do you know what the single most, uh, what the predictor of success for entrepreneurs is? What do you think is the characteristic or the attribute that uh, confidently predicts whether or not an entrepreneur will be successful or not? And I went through all the list, you know, business plan, money, like, you know, the business idea, connections relationships like all the stuff that i thought would be important and he just smiled and he said no it's one thing it's a personality trait um, he said 
every entrepreneur, every successful entrepreneur, has at some time had a professional, that's a lawyer or an accountant or you know, one of those type of people, walk into their office, sit down and go, it's over. And the unsuccessful entrepreneurs are the ones that go, okay, and give up. And the successful entrepreneurs are the ones that go, no, no, we're going to do it this way instead. So the personality trait that you need to be a successful entrepreneur um, is tenacity. It's not intellect. Yeah. And, you know, access to capital. It's not the amount of knowledge you have. It's not whether you've got an MBA or whether you haven't got an MBA. It is simply sheer bloody mindedness that makes the difference. And over 27 years of running my own businesses, I have laughed out loud a dozen times when my accountant or my lawyer has come into the office and sat down and went, we should file for bankruptcy. <laughs> and I did, yeah, I thought you would say this. Uh, no, let's move on. So my single piece of advice to anybody who is an inspiring entrepreneur is tenacity is the only thing that matters and then novel ideas like if you do what everybody else does you end up with the same poor results as everybody else the only way you get stellar results is by doing something different and you have to be brave enough to be able to move away from the crowd and not do what everybody else is doing just because everybody says this is the way you know you do presentations or this is the way you process invoices or this is the way you do whatever it is if you just sit there and copy what everybody else does you will never get to an innovative entrepreneurial idea you have to look at the world like that did that work <laughs> turn things upside down and do things differently um and recognize that some of them won't work. And so that's fine. Fail fast, move on to the next idea, and then keep at it. That's how you're successful being an entrepreneur. Okay. I definitely, yeah, I can ask you for forever if you I can't, <laughs> no. I'm really literally got here on my bike, on my motorbike, and my I look like I look awful. Don't worry about it. You look fine. I have to hold my phone, so I can't brush my hair. <laughs> No, we're just very happy to have you. And I never like to start on sort of a negative face, but you talked a lot about failure in, in the end part. Thank you for the education around, you know, the definition of entrepreneur, because it's made me think, oh, I should probably go back and change my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> um, but I wanted to kind of know what were some of the failures that you've received in, you know, some of the jobs you've had and those pushbacks and those moments. And, you know, can you share some of those personal stories with us? Um, well, so the first thing to say, I haven't really, with the, the exception of the last two and a half years, I've been interim as um, head of growth and head of um, sales for Mercer in the UK, which was, I guess, probably a job. Um, I haven't had a job since I was 22, 23, and I started the business. Um, uh, I've been, you know, the boss. Um, one of my observations actually is the last two and a half years of being of stepping into the corporate environment and trying to operate as a senior global executive has been quite interesting because I have a boss for the first time. Um, and what I said, actually probably the first time since I was 17. Um, and that's, and not being at the top of an organization is, is sort of an uncomfortable place to be for an entrepreneur. Like, yeah, I'm used to having an idea coming out and telling everybody what the idea is and then watching everybody scuttle away and do it. And now I come out with an idea and they go, well, we better go and ask Ben Roll what he thinks. That's my, bo my boss. And it's like, oh, okay, that's a novel experience for me. So um, I, I'm not entirely sure how well the entrepreneurial mindset sits. Um, my here, my boss's boss, uh, who's a lovely guy called Rich Newsom? He he's he. They're trying to keep me in the business, and they're trying to keep me in the business because his phrase is Nikki's storm the castle approach to um, to.
to business is not something that you find in the corporate world. The corporate world is, and I have to say this, I'm in an open plan office, but it's okay, it's 6 a.m., nobody's here. Um, the corporate world does seem to drive people to be safe and and to take safe decisions and to not make decisions unless you have to and and it's just slow i, I call it the mercer glue like i'm used to pivoting the business you know yeah with a day and here you can't pivot anything like you know if you're going to make a change it's three months i, I ran a project to stand up a new project a new product um uh, last year and i and and i said well we're going to run it as a kakaku a sprint 90 day this is what we're going to do and honestly they all sat there and uh, it takes us three years to launch a new product i was like don't be stupid it can't possibly take three years and we're going to do it in 90 days now we did it and we succeeded it in delivering it um but now they all talk about how you know that's a significant achievement because the organization managed to deliver a new product in 90 days and i'm like oh like Still not quick enough for the real world. So you're working on a 720 million um, pound deal, and I wanted to know what some of the kind of conversations you're having to teach those businesses to to win that deal. What are some of the messages, but behind them that you're you're teaching these teams? So I guess my um, so I have two skills. I think um, one is I'm a good coach, and I'll talk about what coaching is in a second. And the other is um. I don't know, top 10 in the world in terms of sales messaging, something like that. Um, and the thing with sales messaging, so, or the value proposition is there's a lot of confusion. Mostly when I ask people, what's your value proposition for your business? I get a description of the proposition. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. Right? That's not what the client wants to hear. Like, I'm not really interested in what you do. What I'm interested in is what value does it drive for me? What is the benefit of that to me? And because most people in most businesses spend most of their time thinking about how to deliver the thing, whatever the thing is, they often, in fact, almost all the time, um, don't spend any time thinking about the value the thing drives for the customer. Sales messaging is all about that. Like you don't care what I do and how I do. Like you only for my my pitch is really simple. Like people win one in three, maybe one in four of the deals that they chase, unless I coach, and then they win three out of four. So you double or treble your chances of winning the deal, and you don't pay me unless you win. That's a pretty bloody good sales pitch. Yeah. Like like. You know, it's there's no downside to bringing me on. You treble your chances of winning. I might be completely full of shit. Well, who cares? Because, you know, it doesn't cost you anything if I'm wrong. Um, but I don't talk about the methodology. I don't talk about how I do it. I don't talk about the resource. I don't talk about any of that because, frankly, they don't care. They just want to win. So it's the same thing for all of your businesses and all of your business ideas. Like you're going to spend, when you put your business plan together, your business plan is all about how you're going to do the things you're going to do. Nobody cares. Why are the clients going to pay you money to do whatever it is you're going to do is the only thing that matters. And that's the value proposition. So first mistake, we don't actually think about what value we drive for the customer. It's the second mistake. We confuse the value of the product or service with the value of our organization delivering that value or service. Now, most entrepreneurial businesses, because it's a new service, there's nobody else out there doing the thing that we're doing because we've come up with an innovative way of solving whatever the problem is. We probably don't need to think too hard about the organizational value. Why would you do this with me rather than my competitor? Because I don't have any competitors, right? But whatever your business is, whenever you start it, if it's good and throws off cash, and cash is the only thing that matters, you'll have competitors, competitors very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so lots of new business ideas fail in the second phase because they don't recognize they need to shift from here's the value of the product 
to now the product's got competition. Here's the value of buying the product from us rather than somebody else. Mm. And those conversations are hard to have with teams of people, particularly small teams of people. I mean, if you've got, you know, if you've got 20 or 30 people that are all working really hard to deliver whatever it is the service or the product is you've developed, what will happen is all you think about is how would you get, how do we get this thing out the door? Like with customers paid as we don't get paid until it's delivered. And so you think about delivery and you think about how to get it to the point where you can raise the invoice in order to get the cash. It's very hard then to step back from that and go, okay, why is ours a better solution than the competitors? So I spend a lot of my time, it's almost like studying philosophy. Like I spend a lot of my time listening carefully to their arguments and picking apart a couple of things. The first one is often there is no value in the things that they talk about. Right? They talk about the things that's important to them, right? the things that you know they've, they've developed a solution for this, right? and they're really proud of that, and so they want to talk about that. Right? If it doesn't impact me as a customer, I don't care. First mistake. Second mistake, they talk about the value of the product or service, which they'll get from everyone, rather than the, the value they get from us. And the business I'm in at the moment is wealth business and we provide pensions. You know, we're having conversations about um, you know, the assets that we're going to manage. Yeah. Everybody in this business is passionate about we can build more asset value like if you give me your 27 billion um, dollars worth of assets i'll put them into the marketplace and you'll get a higher return the problem is that's the same that's exactly the same thing that all of our competitors say like everybody says it's better returns so we have to we have to say something different and differentiate ourselves and my take on it is you don't want returns what you want is outcomes and if you're a pension fund, for example, um, maybe you don't want to just maximize the value of your assets. Maybe you need your assets to be liquid enough to be able to pay out your liabilities as people start to draw the pensions. And so absolute returns isn't what you need. What you need is to de-risk the profile in order to match the cash profile that's coming out at the end of the business. And that necessarily gives lower returns because you're not taking on board so much risk can have your business and what we've done is changed the uh, changed the basis of the decision that the client is making by educating the client into, into thinking about their problem slightly differently uh, i'll give you my uh, two minute lesson in solution selling uh, there's a guy called michael bosworth um wrote a book called solution selling probably 30 years ago and then rewrote it well actually just renamed it i think customer centric selling but it's actually a really smart it's one of the few really smart sales methodologies out there and uh, here's how i explain it to people seemingly every day um let's say i want to buy a round oak peg and i, I need it to be 22 millimeters in diameter and so i go to everybody on the phone and say do you provide round oak pegs and i get a short list of five of you and you all say yes and i say how much and you will give me a price how do i make a decision Right. They all look the same. Like I'm, just, you know, probably just going to buy the cheapest because all the fastest, all you know, the stuff that get there. I mean, that's how I make my decision. Until one of you, Michaela, looks at me and goes, "What are you buying a round peg for?" And I go, "Well, I have an oak dining table, and it's got a, down, a hole in it, and I have a 22 mil bit, so I can drill a 22 mil hole through the damaged bit, and then I'll be able to take the peg, put the peg in." sand it flat, fix my table. Michaela, being a smart girl, goes, hmm, wouldn't a square peg be better? And then all the edges of the hole would line up with the grain and you would never see it. It would be an invisible repair. Oh, yeah, that would be much better, but I don't have a square, a way of, you know, making a square hole. Michaela says, well, I have a special drill called a reamer that will ream a 22 mil square hole, and I have a square peg. Much better solution. Would you like it? It is three times the cost of the round pegs, but it's a much better solution. Can I have your business? 
to which I'm going to go, yes. That's solution selling in a nutshell. Right? What you need to do when you're solution selling is to not ask the client, the prospect, about what the problem is, about what the solution is. Like they're out saying, I want an IT system to do this, or I want my pension to do that, or I, you know, I want a technology piece to do this. Right? Instead of going and saying, what do you want? What, you know, what is it you want? You know, go out and what do you want that for? What are you trying to achieve? And maybe we can find a better way of achieving that problem for you. And as soon as you change the prospect's perception, even one iota about what the solution is, now you and that prospect have a shared vision of what good looks like. And now you're in pole position because you help them understand the problem. You didn't just respond to the solution. Mm-hmm. And solution selling is really important for entrepreneurs because it is at the heart of the entrepreneurial process. What is the problem? What's the innovative way I can sell it? Entrepreneurs are almost always good, innate salespeople because what we end up doing is trying to solve other people's problems in novel ways in order to shift resources to the right place in order to make a better return by, you know, my, my margin on my square rema and my square peg, four times the margin on round pegs because there's no competition. I'm the only one that's got the solution. Therefore, make more margin. Make more margin means throw off more cash. Throw off more cash means yacht in the Bahamas. <laughs> I love that. So, you know, just digging a little bit deeper, what are you needing it for? And then sort of getting them to tell you more and kind of playing into the story. So, that's really helpful I guess also from an entrepreneur's point of view maybe public speaking and presenting can be a scary concept and again this is something that you do in day in day out helping your clients I just wondered if you had any quick tips on how people can become more confident in this space um okay so uh, so I have a whole training course for this (laughs) (laughs) Uh, the first thing is if I asked you all to write down, to draw a graph, right? And in the plot on the graph, confidence versus performance. Uh, most people draw a straight line. Most people um, think that the biggest problem for public speaking is that people lack confidence and therefore the presentation is rubbish. And the more confident you are, the better the presentation is. And it's a myth, right? And it's a myth propagated by those people that are afraid of it. Here's an interesting stat for you. Um, I told this joke at my mother's funeral, which is which did actually make them all laugh. Um, the number of people who are afraid of public speaking is more in total than the people who are afraid of dying, afraid of spiders, afraid of small places, and afraid of big spaces, which means statistically speaking, most of the audience at my mum's funeral would rather have been in the coffin than in the pulpit giving the presentation. You are allowed to judge. That is a joke. Like, although it is true, the stats stack up, right? You know, small places at death, the coffin is less scary than standing in the pulpit and and doing the public speaking, but it's not true. Okay. It's a, think of it as a standard distribution curve, right? That a lack of confidence, you know, people who can't, get their words out and say their name like obviously that's bad but the other side which is way more common actually is where people are really comfortable speaking and so confident and overconfident that they forget that the presentation is not about them Mm. it's about the audience and so their effectiveness at delivering their messages, at delivering something of worthwhile to the audience, peters off quite rapidly once you pass that mean of your standard distribution curve. And the interesting thing is if you take a standard distribution curve and you just look at, you know, like the second quartile, it looks like a straight line. Mm. 
Mm. And that's where everybody focuses. Everybody focuses on, well, this person can't say their name when they stand up. So what I need to do is boost their confidence and their performance will get better. And if you're focusing your attention and you ignore the people at the other end, because, well, they don't have a problem. They're very confident, you know, they're articulate and kind of stand up and tell a joke and they'll be fine. And so you ignore them. But actually, the people who lack confidence are relatively easy. As long as you know your subject, that the, the biggest tip is to find ways of getting people to remove the script. So what most people do when they lack confidence mm -hmm. is they decide that actually engaging and talking to the audience, that's a bit scary. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll write a speech and then I'll read the speech and then I just get terrified. Right, because I'm going to stand up and do something that I've been doing since I was three, which is reading out loud. And, and you know, we all know that that is a shit presentation. Right? And so there's no way around it. If I'm going to read a speech, like unless you're really, really good, unless you're Obama and you can make that, read that speech in a way that makes it feel like you're not reading it, that's a real hard skill. And the best thing, is to not script your speech. The best thing is to go in with what's the point you're going to make and talk about it as if you were on a phone call with a couple of mates. And then you'll get something that's interesting and engaging but has the right messages. So don't script your speeches is my top tip. Keep an eye on the time. Keep them short, and um, but don't script them. I love that. No, I, I use the same technique. I bullet point things. So I'll have the subject there and then I'll talk around it. So thank you. You can reconfirm my public speaking trait is, is the right one. Um, I also wanted to say you've been recognised for British LGBT top 10 inspirational leaders uh, last year. And what does receiving this recognition mean to you? Also, just want to make people aware if you would like to drop any questions, please leave them down in the Q&A box as we're shortly going to open to your questions. So, yeah, what did the recognition mean to you, Nikki? Um, uh, so it's quite humbling, actually. Um, like I've had three awards um, post transition, and uh, what, so I was on the Financial Times Outstanding list, um, which is hundred LGBT role models, and then I was on the Heroes list, which is hundred women who support women in business, and then last year, utterly surprisingly, I got nominated by some colleagues at Mercer for the Inspirational Leader um, thing, and uh, and it's all quite. Yeah, humbling, really. I, when when I was nominated for the first one, I'll tell you a quick story, without try I try not to cry. Um, uh, so you get nominated, and then you have to decide whether to accept the nomination or not. And I was minded to not accept, and um, and I was out at dinner with. Uh, I don't have a huge number of trans friends. Um, uh, but I have a couple that are quite, I'm quite fond of. And I was out with a friend called Sophie, uh, who's about my age. Um, she's a VC. Um, you know, we get on quite well. Um, I've known her for probably 10 years. Um, and we were out at dinner in Soho, drunk, as you often are. Over. Right, right, and she right. said, oh, have you heard about the uh, outstanding list are you, uh, are you on it and i said well yes I've, the you know they've nominated me and asked me if i want to be on the list but i'm thinking of turning it down and she said why and i said well because you know, most people who are on this list have, have got kind of really tough life stories to tell and they've had to overcome diversity and they've had to overcome prejudice and they've, they've had to fight to be who they are and they have you know horror stories and they're amazing people because they've got this conviction and inner strength and and i don't have any of that well, my life is just a joy i mean i just stepped into the role of princess like the world opens itself out to me and treats me like a goddess i i like i don't have any of those stories to tell i shouldn't be a role model and sophie bless her burst into tears 
and said, I nominated you. I was like, oh, oh wow. shit. <laughs> like, so we both first did. Oh. Well, why did you nominate me? Like, of all the people that could be on the list, there's lots of people who are better suited than me. And she said, well, here's what you need to understand. Um, are you guys there or are you frozen? No, we're here. We're here. Can you see us okay? All right. All right. Yeah, 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 we're here. So Sophie said, here's why I nominated you. She said uh, she'd been trans uh, since she was four. She, she knew that uh, she was in the wrong body and that she wanted to be a girl since she was really young. Um, and she said, but it's been my deep, dark secret. Like, I don't... Nobody knows. Um, her wife doesn't know. Her kids don't know. Her parents don't know. And she spent her entire life grabbing moments where she could, you know, dress as a girl and, you know, be herself, mm. um, all in secret for her entire life. And then nine years ago, I walked into a bar in Soho and she said, You were a breath of fresh air. Like, you walked in like you owned it and didn't give a shit what anybody else thought. And we became friends and I follow your Facebook and I see you go all over the world, you know, getting on planes and getting on trains and, you know, crossing borders and living your life. And you give me hope that one day I can be me. Oh, that's such a great story. And, and yeah, so I, I did. <laughs> I also, yeah, so I decided to say, uh, yes, I, I will yeah. be a role model list in it but then it kind of changed my behavior a lot mm -hmm. so in the trans community lots of people talking about, talk about the, how the goal is to pass is to you know for me to sit in a restaurant and have nobody in the restaurant recognize that I'm trans um, and just to interact with me as if I were a cisgendered um, exceptionally large six foot four in my heels female you know and we kid ourselves that might be able to pull that off um, and that's the goal right so that's the, the narrative in the trans community is like you need to be passable and you know passable is the goal and you know have people um treat you like you're a cis woman which which obviously at my age means just ignore me um but which again actually is what lots of trans women want right like they don't want no notoriety they don't want to be called out on the street and they want just to be invisible in the background and for people to leave them alone um and i once i got on the list i worked out that i couldn't really be a role model if um if i wasn't visible so if i if i walk down the street and nobody notices the trans woman i haven't started any conversations i haven't changed anybody's point of view i haven't and so i i started to work out that in order to be a role model i need to be visible i need to be seen i need people to recognize that i'm trans so i don't change my voice and i don't hide and i introduce myself like i did today i used to be a boy but i'm all right now like that is deliberately to out myself so yeah. that everybody knows what they're talking to and those that have a problem can leave and those that don't stay and we have a much more engaging conversation um so and and it changes everything like it changes the way i dress it changes the way i do my makeup it changes the way i i, I approach every social interaction like it's it's um and i think it's probably quite cathartic as well because you know when you're trying to be stealth incognito you worry about being found out but when you're not there's no worry <laughs> it's like i don't i don't worry that people think i might be a boy i'm like no it's fine <laughs> it's like oh. i used to be a boy but i'm all right now ask me why I'm better definitely and i love how you called that out and actually that that leads us on really well to one of the questions we've had in um i'll leave it to, to michaela to ask that one thank you so much for that call nikki um we have a question here that's really linked to what you discussed now that says um what could we do to encourage support of non-binary people in the world of entrepreneurship so what would you what message would you would you tell non-binary people and how can others be allies to those people 
So non-binary people are, are like an interesting subset of trans. Um, and, I, and, and I'm not entirely sure that that association with being a subset of trans is particularly helpful. So lots of the trans community, um, transgender, transsexual, right, are all are sort of bought into the binary. Uh, so we, we have a very famous public idiot in the community called Caitlin Jenner. Right, uh, who's rather, uh, who's just a 72 year old woman um, mm -hmm. with 72 year old attitudes towards everything and has just come out and said, Well, there are only two genders. And you're like, No, right. Um, but lots of the narrative that is around is still lo locked into gender as a binary that you're either a boy or you're a girl, that there's no, that there's, that there's, there's nothing in between. Um, I might tell you about the six because my, my personal favorite interpretation of gender is the Aztec six gender thing. But I'll come back to that. Um, non binary specifically, it, uh, you, you're challenging something that happens in system one in the brain. So you, if you're familiar with system one, system two, thinking fast, thinking slow, like that your animal brain kind of makes decisions very quickly. And then your, your, your second system will come in and rationalize them afterwards. That first system, system one, is essentially a uh, um, safety mechanism. Like it's looking for predators. It's looking to keep you safe. It's the bit that makes you step back uh, off the road when the bus driver beeps the horn and you don't get killed because, you know, you saw the bus at the last minute. Um, and basically, what happens when you walk into a room? Right, we all know at an at, at a you know base level, the only thing that can really kill us in this life um, is a Russian. I, I mean, another human being, right? Um, uh, and so we do a threat assessment, and we also know that almost without exception, right, the human being that's going to kill us is male not female right and so the first thing we look for are gender cues right this not consciously like unconsciously we look and assess whether what people's gender is because the male of the species is the one with the big arms and the big fists and the 400 pounds and is going to come over and beat me up because they like my handbag or whatever right? and so your brain constantly looks and tries to assess gender if you're like me and you're trying to fool the world into thinking that my gender is female not aligned with my sex you need four times the gender cues to overcome female gender cues to overcome every male gender cue and i have two male gender cues that you know, i can't do anything about i'm six foot right? which means six foot four in my heels um there are very few six foot four kind of women walking through the planet. Uh, actually, a lot of Afrikaans, so I pass in Johannesburg really well. Um, but, you know, actually, here in Australia or in Asia or in the UK, like I stand out in the crowd, like my head is above everybody else's and that draws the eye. And so that's a male gender cue. In order to overcome that, I need at least four female gender clues, long hair, makeup, clothes, and the way my body moves, my, you know, my hips. Um, uh, uh, you can tell the sex of a skeleton by looking at the top of the female and um, you know, boys are straight and girls are kinked over because uh, post puberty, the, the pelvis has grown to accommodate the womb. And I, unfortunately, my life regret do not have a womb had to borrow somebody else's and so my femurs are straight and because of that when i walk normally my hips stay straight whereas in a cisgendered female there is a slight rock to the waist as a girl walks so trans girls have to we have to, we have to lead with our hips if we want to walk down a street and be seen as female otherwise we look like a boy in a dress because of the way our hips articulate. So the, the human brain, 
right, at a primal level, is constantly looking for the men, right? Uh, it, it will engage system level two in when it sees a threat, right? So if you, if you walk into a room and a guy immediately stands up and starts walking towards you, like suddenly you're really aware of that, right? And our strategies will be different depending on our gender and depending on our sex, depending on our size and all sorts. But, you know, we notice the guy that's walking towards us and we, then we look for eye contact. And if the guy's looking at us and walking towards us, well, you know, now we're getting into a defensive position. We're moving our body and we're changing our route and we're doing things differently because the threat is walking to us. So if you're non-binary, you are pushing against something that is programmed in hard to people's brain. Like I'm just trying to flip it. I'm just trying to flip the switch from male to female, right? And it's you know hard, but relatively straightforward. And I know what to do and I know how to do it. If you're non-binary, you're, you're, you're trying to say that's a crock that's which it is like that's rubbish like and i'm neither of those and treat me differently and uh, and so it's hard it's harder to do and i think non-binary people have to be more deliberate about it so pronouns are really important to non-binary people but um because that what you're trying to do by disassociating yourself from cisgendered pronouns is you're trying to say don't classify me into those um but it's really hard for everybody else because our brains automatically switch between the two right threat non-threat not male female threat non-threat right the threats are all him and he and the non-threats are often she and her. And so that pronoun switch for non-binary people is really, really difficult. And I think for an organizational point of view, they are the litmus test for the rest of us. So if you can, you know, we should degender our recruitment process. We should degender our marketing materials. We should use they and them and not use he and him and we shouldn't say dear sir or dear madam we should just say you know dear bob or dear all or something non-gendered and that the touch point for that are people who are non-binary because they're the ones that are at the front end of that they're the ones that we have to accommodate the most but by accommodating them that then flows back to all of us doesn't it and so um you know, I, I've written an article for the end of the month for Trans Day of Visibility. Um, pronouns are really interesting. Uh, I, I, one of the things I put in it is, don't ask me what my pronouns are. Like people come up to me, and go, oh, what pronouns do you use? And I'm like, really? I spent an hour and a half doing my face. Like, I'm wearing a, you know, 500 pound Michael Kors dress. I'm wearing Jimmy shoes and carrying a Louboutin handbag. Which pronouns do you think are appropriate? Idiot, right? So my response when people ask my pronouns is just that. Oh, I don't mind. Well, I don't use pronouns for myself. I don't refer to myself in the third person. I call myself Nikki or princess. Knock yourself out, right? By the way, you choose what pronouns you want for me, but bear in mind, everybody else listening is going to judge your choice. And if you decide to use he and him for me, they're all going to know you're an idiot. But I quite like to know where the idiots are in the room. So knock yourself out, sunshine. Use whatever pronouns you feel comfortable with. And nobody ever misgenders me. Like, that's a bit too aggressive for people, so they always get it right. Um, so I never express them. Like, it's not in my email. Like, it's not, I, I, don't, I don't put Nikki brackets, she, her. Like, uh, like, don't ask me, right? However, if you're cisgendered, and you put your pronouns in your email often reduces me to tears. Like it's such an affirmation because what you're saying to me and our non, particularly our non-binary um, colleagues is that you recognize the legitimacy of us changing our pronouns and it's like, it's just, 
a beautiful thing to do. Like it makes, I think, every single one of the trans community, wherever we sit on the gender spectrum, it makes us, it gives us a warm feeling. It says we've got allies, we've got friends, we've got people who are tolerant of the fact that I used to be a boy, but I'm all right now. So for all of you cisgendered people, if I never ask people to do it, and I'm not asking you to do it, but if you have done it, on behalf of everybody in the trans community, thank you. It is a wonderful, beautiful thing for you to do. But don't then assume that you need to ask me what my pronouns are, <laughs> because that's just going to wind me up. Thank you so much for this, Nikki. This has been probably the best answer to this question I ever heard in my life, noting everything down. And I think I'm not the only one who was really moved by all the logic and all the sound reasoning you brought into this. It is deeply appreciated. I'm very moved. I see Sharina being very moved as well. So I'm going to make her job a bit more difficult and I'm going to hand back to her. She's got some fireside questions definitely lined up for you. And we're going to slowly wrap up, but I'm really moved and thank you for this. Thank you very much for that, Vicky. I do agree. I think um, it's just been great to understand that. And I know myself and Michaela both use our pronouns and I can see Victor's very grateful for that answer as well. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of uh, just do some quick fire round questions uh, and see where we get to. So um, what does the acronym LGBTQIA stand for? It's a little quiz, I know what it is. Okay, so uh, um, <laughs> I'm trying to start with it to tell a joke. Uh, <laughs> L, L is for lesbian, that's girls that like girls. Uh, G is for gay, that's boys that like boys. B is for bi, that's those of us who haven't made our minds up. And T is for fabulous. Love that. <laughs> on the real, so it's obviously lesbian, gay, bi, trans. Uh, uh, Q is queer, which is which is sort of a collective for all of us. It sort of means not boring i mean not straight uh, you know what i mean uh, i is um uh, intersex which is a, a biological thing and then a is asexual like not interested in sex at all the interesting thing about lgbtqia two interesting things uh, one is t's in the middle draw your own conclusions um uh, and perhaps more importantly t is not an expression of sexual preference everything else is L G B Q I A. That's all about who you like in the bedroom. T has nothing to do with my sexuality. So T's are sometimes L, sometimes G, sometimes B, sometimes Q, sometimes I, sometimes A. Mostly all of it at once. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. That's so, so good. Um, and any tips on good engagement for? Um, and for not causing offence so you know if you I think you've covered a little bit of this if if you find yourself in the situation where you want to rebuttal some people's comments I think you know I see sort of was just calling it so I think um are we talking to budding entrepreneurs here right so <laughs> that's this is a piece of advice It'll go both ways like I'm gonna like I'm going to say something that's a little bit contentious and might upset people, right? particularly people that are more your age than my age. Right? Sometimes, so I got I got uh, um, chastised by a trans lady not so long ago for using the word tranny. And when I came out, like the 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 big get together every Wednesday night in Soho, there was a get together called Tranny Shack, right? And Tranny Shack has a real kind of close like, but for Tranny Shack, I would never have made my journey, like, right? And so I don't actually find the word tranny insulting at all, um, right? And I don't really understand why anybody would find it offensive. Um, she made the mistake of then saying to me, it's our N word, right? <laughs> Which just kind of incensed me. Um, 
as I don't remember, 2,000 years of systematic, systematic abuse and uh, bondage and servitude and slavery uh, in the trans history. So uh, I think we have to be very, very careful when we appropriate kind of other people's hardships and, and, and draw parallels. There is no parallel between the word tranny and the N word, and we, we can't go down there. So my conclusion is, if you mean to, you know, I, I sometimes people misgender me, right? And sometimes it's upsetting, but the times it's upsetting is when they've done it on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And there's something about Uber taxi drivers, like in London, like they, they do it on purpose all the time. Like they turn around with a big smile on their face and say, hello, sir. And you just think, oh, you know, Get with the time. Yeah. Uh, but, you're but they're trying to be offensive, right? Completely different from the guy who hasn't paid any attention has heard me sit in the back of the car and say King's Cross, please, right? And turns around and says, yes, sir. Right. Well, I'm not upset by that because he didn't look like he, he just heard my voice and he's reacted to my voice. It's a boy's voice. You know, why would I get upset about it? So I think some people look for offense. Like some people have a, a victim mentality that means they walk around. Like sometimes we call these people snowflakes. Right, um, and uh, and often they're at the front end of the council culture. They don't want to hear things that they, you know, don't want to hear. Like they take everybody. You know, if you have a social media feed and you've removed everybody that ever disagreed or put you know, an opinion that you didn't agree to, you've just put yourself in a bubble that you're never going to learn anything from. So you, you know, be careful how you react. And I think you have a responsibility to not intentionally cause offense, clearly. And you have a responsibility to try not to cause offense inadvertently, but you do not have a responsibility for looking after everybody else's response to truthful statements. And so, you know, I think we could all just calm down a little bit around um, what people say look at the intent of what people say rather than the words and quite often when you get into a debate with somebody if they're losing the debate they can end the conversation by kind of pulling you up on the words you've used um, and it's a you know it's the resort of somebody weak-minded often like I'm losing this debate and so I'm going to accuse you of being a racist and walk off or accuse you of being sexist and walk off or accuse you of being whatever and have my dramatic exit because you are clearly, you know, one of the idiots and you're not really engaging with the argument and you're not engaging with the, the person and you're not engaging with the content and you're not really adding any value. You're just kind of storming off in a huff. Yeah. Oh. Well, thank you so much, Nikki. That's been actually so interesting because cancel culture is real and you're right, it is more prevalent in people our age. And yeah, that kind of dialogue of having an open conversation and being able to learn. And I think that's what this, e this evening's been about. It's been able to ask those questions. You've been able to be open with us and educate us because at the end of the day, we wouldn't be on this call if we didn't want to learn about business. We didn't want to learn about all the advocacy you're doing um so we're very very thankful for your time thank you for the top sales tips pitching tips um and also sort of how you go around winning business um and all the fabulous things we will be popping nikki's contact details um in the bottom of this episode so you guys can go and listen to it but thank you so much nikki uh, we really appreciate your time uh, it's a pleasure i'm i'm really sorry we started late well, thank you. I do know that the lights have come on and it's behind me. So I assume, uh, I assume the Australian workers are all turning up to the office now, uh, which means there's a good chance I can go down and get my coffee. Sounds good. Have an amazing day, just as we're ending our day. Thank you, Nikki. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.